Hello everyone, how's it going? Happy Wednesday, welcome to Casual Krakoa. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. Get your questions in now, if you so choose, if you are here live, thanks to those of you joining today for Casual Krakoa Live on the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel. But seriously, get those questions in. This is going to be the most casual of all Krakoas. <laughs> there, there's not that much to talk about today. I've got a few ideas. Um, I've got a handful of things, especially in response to uh, Hickman leaving X-Men, my conversation, my interview with Cy Spurrier this week, uh, writer of Way of X and other great comics, but, you know, a part of the X office, right? And that conversation with Cy Spurrier, I highly recommend those of you that are so inclined, check it out on the CBH channel. It was really a pleasure to get to talk to Cy, to get to talk all things Way of X and X-Men. He had some really interesting insights and reveals into kind of the nature of the X office post Hickman. Okay, so you can watch the whole thing or I'll talk about it a little bit here. But I want to talk about a little bit what that got some wheels spinning, what that made me think about in terms of like where the X line is going, what it means for X-Men comics moving forward, as well as just some of the reflections about. So last week, in the wake of the news that Hickman would be leaving X-Men comics after Inferno, you know, a big thing that, that we were talking about was I had a theory why Hickman, why it kind of means Hickman isn't, like, it doesn't mean Hickman's really leaving X-Men, okay? And I talked a whole bunch about that last week, like a whole hour nonstop, and a bunch of the comments were around this idea of, like, who could replace a writer, a creator like a Jonathan Hickman as the head of X, as the new head of X. So I wanted to touch on that idea around who could replace the head of X, because I have some thoughts on the matter. But otherwise, today, you know, the new X-Men comics that came out would be uh, Cable Reloaded, number one, which there's a proper... Kraken Krakoa 4, okay, you can find Kraken Krakoa number 193, Cable Reloaded Reloaded is up on the YouTube channel, um, but also uh, Wolverine number 15 came out today, which is not going to get a Kraken Krakoa, but I can talk a little bit about, like, what I thought of it, and, and what's going on, and uh, some connections, actually, surprisingly, that it had to Cable Reloaded. So, thanks to those of you, who, again, who are joining live. Um, all I ask here, for those of you live in the chat, one, get in as many questions as you like. The Super Chat is open. If you want to donate and get your question in, get it prioritized, that would be amazing. Uh, also, you know, I do want to ask here, be polite, be respectful to those around you, and uh, and we'll have a, a fun time here on Casual Kirko, okay? So, let's talk about what is going on X office wide, and then I'll get to as many questions as I can, because again, light week of comics, we're definitely in a gap period here between all the events, right? We got Trial of Magneto going on now, we got um, you know the build towards Inferno, we're gonna have Onslaught Revelation. I think once we get to like mid-September, we're gonna be Trial of Magneto in full swing, we're gonna be Onslaught Revelation happening, and then we're gonna be Inferno kicking off. I think it's gonna feel like X-Men comics being important, being sort of essential again. Whereas right now, there's a lot of smaller stake stuff. There's a lot of character growth, a lot of character building. Um, but, you know, otherwise, like, it's light. <laughs> it's light. There's literally only two comics today. And, uh, you know, one of them, Wolverine, for example, is really just kind of letting the beat build, right? So let's talk about what actually happened a little bit with Cable Reloaded. Um, so, again, I went in depth on the Kraken Krakoa. But one thing Cable Reloaded really... Uh, sort of helped stand out for me today is how perfect Al Ewing is as the creator to take over X-Men Cosmic from Jonathan Hickman, okay? Now, I think as a creator, Al Ewing at this point has a resume, a Marvel resume specifically through Ultimates, Ultimates 2, Immortal Hulk. Um, those are probably the knockouts for me that he has written. There's other good stuff in there, but those are the knockouts. But through those, at least, would be a very good head of X, right? I love Sword. I love what's happened. I thought Cable Reloaded today was incredibly fun. Um, he'd be like, if you if you need one individual to become the head of X, L. Ewing totally makes sense. He's a, he's a creator of that caliber. Um, but I think the thing is, like, people last week, it, it was something that I wouldn't have thought of. People were really obsessed with this idea of one single creative type taking over for Hickman, right? Of someone actually filling the role of head of X. And I think as I kind of talked through it and tried to answer that on the fly, you know, one thing that occurred to me is like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> like the role of head of X is remarkably unique in the history of Marvel comics. Again, even if you think about creators who might have held a title like that, and the only one, you know, the, who comes particularly close is like a Chris Claremont, 
in the 80s, that, was, that wasn't something that was set up. That was something that just sort of happened organically, right? Hickman coming to X-Men was a unique situation where this was a creator who had done some really, really special work from in the Marvel Universe from 2008 through very early 2016, then left to go fully create her own, right? So to bring him back as part of the package, as part of the sweetener on the deal to come do House and Powers and, and bring this, you know, X-Men pitch to life, part of the package there was also this role as the head of X. Again, that is not a role that exists for other creators on other lines, you know? It, that's just not really a thing that has existed or has happened. It was pretty specific and unique to Hickman's position in his career and also sort of what he was envisioning as a creator, which was building this X office and, and building this line and having some oversight, you know? Because again, like the idea of sort of the player coach, the editorial and the writer, you know, and the storyteller um, for comics at the big two at Marvel and DC, that's extremely uncommon. That does not happen a, a heck of a lot, you know? So the idea that Marvel would be like, oh, we're going out to get such and such to come in as the new head of X, um, it's just, you can just leave the position vacant and frankly, nothing changes. You know, it, it's kind of an irreplaceable position. I think you fill it by committee. You fill it by committee and what you do is you let the existing X office, who's already there with some incredibly talented writers and creators, is you let them fill the gap. So that's kind of what I'm settling on here today and what this, you know, probably the card for the video is titled, if you're all seeing that, is Al Ewing is the perfect cosmic head of X. He's already the head of Marvel Cosmic, right? Al Ewing right now has the reins to Marvel Cosmic. He's writing Guardians of the Galaxy. He's writing The Last Annihilation Event, which is what Cable Reloaded uh, crossed over with today. Like, this is the shaper of Marvel Cosmic, right? And, and in a lot of ways... His career at Marvel has been building to that. And, you know, again, with Ultimates and Ultimates 2 in particular, um, where you can look at it and say, like, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. It makes an absolute ton of sense. Um, so, like, I don't know that there's any creator on, on this, you know, the, the landscape that I focus on, right, on, on the big two in Marvel and DC, who would be a better fit right now to follow up on the threads of Cosmic Marvel that Jonathan Hickman laid down in House of X and in Powers of Ten, right? Like, the only creators who are better at cosmic stuff, I see someone mentioned in the chat here, Jim Starlin, okay? I'm a huge Jim Starlin fan. Love Jim Starlin, uh, creator of Thanos, Drax, Gamora. Got to talk to Jim Starlin for a uh, for podcast interview on Kree Annotators number 50. Got to talk to him about Dread Star, a creator-owned series that I love. Read all the Jim Starlin comics. Read them all. Totally worth it, Okay. Jim Starlin is the father of Cosmic, the godfather of Cosmic, whatever you want to say, whatever accolades you want to be still there or bestow there, um, also had his moment, right? So, like, to me, it's like anyone who had their moment decades ago is not going to come in into this head of X, which is a relatively fresh movement. You know, it is a relatively fresh writer's office. You know, um, and you have individuals here with experience, you know, in talking to Cy Spurrier this week and, and going back and reading, you know, I like to I like to read basically as much as I can from a career's work before I interview them, whether I'm going to be talking about it or not. It's just one, it's kind of a fun experience to go back and read books by creators I like that I haven't gotten to. And two, it helps me sort of connect dots in terms of how they think about story and whatnot. And one thing you see with Cy is like <laughs> writing comics for a long time, right? Like people talk about, you know, oh, Hickman's off X-Men. It's like, this void of, of experienced creators, absolutely not true. Simon Spurrier has a, or he goes by Cy, Cy Spurrier has a long history, a decade plus, well more, that of really good comics. Uh, same for Zeb Wells, right? Zeb Wells was a part of the Spider-Man team doing brand new day comics before Hickman was really writing anything for, for Marvel, you know? And then, of course, Al Ewing has been writing comics for, you know, at Marvel for, you know, the majority of the past decade, right? Jerry Duggan. Like started co-writing Deadpool in 2012, right? So you have creators with history. Um, and I think, again, getting back to the main point, who's better at Cosmic right now than Al Ewing, right? Unless you're just looking at legends <laughs> who were better in their heyday, a la Jim Starlin, a la Jack Kirby, these impossible bars. Like Al Ewing's absolutely at the top of the list. And you know, we only find them when they're dead, right? His, his creator-owned series at Boom. It's a very cosmic huge, huge Kirby-esque kind of ideas, like, like, absolutely a fantastic 
fantastic voice to have in the X office running Marvel Cosmic. But then, you know, here's the thing, why it matters so much to have Ewing in this moment. Because I really think this got overlooked in the wake of the news and in the attitudes of the sky is falling around, oh, if Hickman's gone, well, the bottom falls out and all X-Men comics fall into this dumpster fire, like, like that sort of attitude. It really overlooked the fact that you already have Al Ewing in place, who for the past three years has been running either 1A or 1B as the best writer at Marvel with Immortal Hulk, okay? In like every year from like 2018, 19, 20, and now into 21, I've had to debate, do I like an X-Men comic more or do I like Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk comic more? That's the number one spot every year, okay? So Ewing's been doing that. That's the track record. But then you also have this creator writing S.W.O.R.D., writing the Cosmic line, controlling the entirety of Marvel Cosmic. No one at Marvel, no one at any other publisher is better suited right now to fill in the Marvel Cosmic side of X-Men. And here's the thing that I keep saying about X-Men comics. The Cosmic side is the most important right now, okay? It's not usually. It's not usually, and it often doesn't feel that way. I suspect, like, the, the general tenor and the build-up to Inferno, you know, all the implications are that's going to be very Earth-based. That's going to be a, a splitting of Krakoa, right? And all these secrets coming to roost. Probably we're not tapping into the heavy cosmic material, although I suspect it will play a role, right? It's going to impact S.W.O.R.D. It's going to impact all these things that have built. But like big picture, down the line, endgame type stuff, where are we going? We're going cosmic. We're going Moira's life, you know, uh, six, where she's thousands of years into the future. We're going po everything in Powers of Ten is futuristic and it's cosmic. And there is no one better to handle that, if not Jonathan Hickman himself, right, who had the ideas and has shared the ideas, <laughs> which was made very clear in that interview with Spurrier, right? They have the ideas. They aren't secrets. It's not like Hickman took his ball and ran home. It's the complete opposite, you know? Shared everything, right? That is that is everything that has been told. Um, Al Ewing's there. It, that really got lost in the conversation about Hickman leaving is like, what What a, you know, it, it's, it's not, you know, I, I keep making sports metaphors, but it's like, I don't think Hickman's the GOAT, so Jordan's not a perfect comparison, but when Jordan leaves the Bulls in the 90s to go play baseball, Scotty Pippen's still there. Scotty Pippen's an all-timer, Hall of Famer, top 50 player. The Bulls still nearly make the finals. Could have made the finals, arguably, but for Scotty Pippen having a fit and, and pouting <laughs> on the bench, right? So, like, that's... Al Ewing is somewhere in that mix, just not to make the exact Pippen-Jordan thing, because that often gets interpreted as goat sidekick, which is kind of inaccurate, really, when you look at the talent levels. Really, it's just, like, amazing creator another amazing creator, one of them leaves, the other one's still there. The other one's still right there. And they're writing S.W.O.R.D. and they're writing all this cosmic stuff. And the cosmic piece of X-Men, you should have tremendous confidence in, so long as Al Ewing's writing it, because he's proven he can do that. He's proven he can do that time and time again, and I think it's going to be very, very good. So there are other pieces, obviously, to the Hickman leaving X-Men that we can lament certain things not happening. You know, and I think as positive and optimistic as I've been, you know, in coming around to the, this sort of reality of Hickman leaving Post Inferno. And just, you know, my positivity largely stems from the ideas have all been shared. It's not like a writer's run got canceled in the middle and they're not going to get to follow up. It's not that, okay? The ideas, the game plan, the strategy, that's all there. The other writers have it. Can they deliver on it in the same way that Hickman would have? We'll see, right? But the plan is all there. So that gives me that gives me some comfort. And then also, you know, the reason I'm not, I, I'm a little more positive about it now too, is like, the, the things I'm most bummed about, I guess let's say, is it would have been really nice post-Inferno to get a Hickman-written Arako book, New Mutants with all Arako characters. It would have been really cool to get a Hickman-written Moira 12-issue series, you know. And I say that as a fan of the creator. But, if Marvel can execute similar ideas, similar potential, with other new voices that they're bringing in. We know Victor Laval's coming. I'm a huge fan of Laval. That's going to be amazing. Great novelist. He's written great comics. Um, Boom Studios, The Destroyer, okay? A riff on Frankenstein, like a modern Frankenstein. Get new voices in this and deliver on some of these concepts. I think if it's the same X office um, hitting some of these huge ideas, right? I think it, it can get a little stale, despite liking a lot of those writers. Um, but I do want to see 
new voices coming into this as well, because I think that's the thing that, that Hickman leaving really opens up more than anything, is like, okay, fine, who can we bring in who can generate some excitement and bring in some new ideas and, and deliver on this stuff? So anyway, I think for people obsessed with the next head of X, there's not going to be a next head of X. That's not a thing. That's not a position that exists and that is going to get filled. Um, at least I would be very, very surprised if that was a thing that happened. You know, I think that position will just fall out. And again, what we're going to have is we're going to have X-Men comics by committee where, you know, Al Ewing is controlling the cosmic side of X-Men. And, and, you know, to touch on, like, I guess a final piece here, one thing you see especially in Cable Reloaded, the comic that came out written by Ewing today, great art by Bob Quinn, uh, colors by Hobbit's Rataglia, Al Ewing knows X-Men. Like, he does, like, he, he knows the Marvel Universe, okay? This creator, he knows the history. He knows how these characters interact. He knows so much about how these universes should function. But, like, one thing you see especially in Cable Reloaded is Ewing is pulling characters who have specific history together. He's pulling from early 90s X-Force. He's pulling from Inferno, the original, okay, with WizKid and the reference to the Exterminators. But then he's also doing totally new things with Korra of the Burning Heart, you know, and really getting some character development and, and some power set development with um, with this Araco mutant, right? Who, we like, again, this is stuff we've hardly seen. Actually, we see this in Wolverine number 15 today. Like, it was a really good day for Araco content, which is something that we have not gotten a heck of a lot of in the X line. Um, but between Korra being great and being this really cool new character in Cable Reloaded and Wolverine number 15 filling in the history of Solemn on Araco, which was some of the, like, again, like, I'm really digging this art. I think Adam Kubert's on fire, first of all, artistically. Um, but I think Percy, like, leaning into the Solemn side of things, Solemn's whole deal, Araco's whole deal, everything about that is way more interesting than what's been happening with Logan, for me at least. Um, so I'm really excited to see that get fleshed out, okay? But we're seeing Araco develop. That's awesome. And then again, just getting back to the core point, Al Ewing knows these characters, okay? He knows this universe. Him controlling and dictating and writing and telling stories on the mutant side of how mutants are involved now in this totally reconfigured Marvel cosmic landscape is the perfect fit. That piece of the pie is solidified, okay? We don't need an additional head of X to make that better. Like, that's a best case scenario <laughs> where it is right now, okay? Now, could you say more needs to get done to make... Um, the the like Krakoa the the Terran based and I'm talking like I'm Yandu or something the Earth based stuff uh, better uh, are there creators who could be a better fit there could that continue to be improved that's going to be the big question right that's going to be the big question is like who's going to step up and nail the Professor X the Moira the Magneto dynamics on Krakoa post Inferno you know because I think it's going to get nailed in Inferno I really do I think Inferno is going to be great I think it's going to have huge ideas I think Hickman's going to answer a lot of questions I think he's going to set the stage for something really really cool and then it's going to be up to Jerry Duggan it's going to be up to Lee Williams it's going to be up to, to Vita Ayala these creators to step in and say and here's what I can do with it and some of them are going to have to step up you know I think Jerry Duggan's going to have to step up if he hasn't already on X-Men with with Pepe Larraz right I think uh Ben Percy it's time for Ben Percy to step up a bunch you know X-Force and Wolverine have been a little too comfortable for a little too long, I would say. Um, I'm always generally invested in those books. I'm not like disinterested to the point where I'm like, this is bad and I don't want to read it. Nothing like that, but very comfortable, very comfortable comics. I don't think they're taking huge chances. I think they need to level up and I don't think they have. Um, I, I think that's like, there are books and there are creators in this line that could level up in a way moving forward with new concepts, with new ideas, with slightly shifted status quos, that would be hugely beneficial, you know? And then you've got somebody like Asai Spurrier, who I talked to this week, obviously, and, and greatly enjoy the work on Way of X. Um, same idea, right? Can the post-Way of X onslaught revelation, Act 2, or, or his, uh, what did he call it, like Season 2, essentially, of whatever the series is going to be called, Spark of X, or Nightcrawler's Dirty Dozen, or whatever it's going to be, um, can that be an even stronger work. Um, and I think it'll need to be. I think it'll need to be because that's that's what the X line's in a precarious position. Like regardless of my optimism, regardless of any positivity that I might feel about where this line can go, the X line is in a precarious position where, again, it's post Jordan Bulls, right? You're trying to sell season tickets. You're trying to sell comics to people who are like, you just lost your superstar. 
And in losing the superstar, I don't know where this is going. So I think the comics are going to need to come out of the gate post Inferno and really like fast. They're going to need to come out and they're going to need to be incredibly strong. And they're going to need to have incredibly new ideas. And uh, will we get that? We'll see. Right? We'll see. But I, I don't know that they're going to get to be as comfortable and as to coast as much as they have. I mean, you know, I've been saying this for a while, but like the reign of X has stagnated tremendously this year. Um, there's been big stuff, right? You can't, to me, anyone arguing like, oh, nothing has happened. That's absurd. I, I think that's kind of a bad faith argument. But from Ten of Swords through to the Hellfire Gala, now through to Inferno, there's stagnation and there's a lot of coasting on the success of House and Powers. There's a lot, a lot of coasting on the fact that these books still do pretty well because House and Powers were such a big deal. Like the down, the trickle down effect of how good that event was is really, really extraordinary and really, really uncommon. But I think we're going to start to lose that after Inferno because the creators in the know and, and everyone communicating this stuff, often not as, um, uh, you know, calmly as I am. <laughs> Right, people get pretty fired up about this. Um, they're going to be talking post inferno, like, okay, that was the end. And the reality is, it's not. The reality is, it's not even close. So, all right, I'm going to pause there for a second. Um, those are my thoughts on why the X office is in good position. I do think it will need to step up its game, but on the cosmic side, on the cosmic side, so long as Al Ewing is there, I think the most important part of this X Men saga, of the post house and powers narrative, is in like the best possible hands with Hickman leaving, and I think that really got overlooked in the wake of that news. All right, um, I'm seeing here some, I'm seeing a lot of questions, so thank you. Uh, everybody keep getting those questions in. I will try to get to as many as I can today. Uh, and again, this won't be the longest casual Krakoa of all time because there were not that many comics to talk about. Okay, uh, I did get the question too that I want to touch on is somebody asked, how do you know, you know, I keep talking about, oh, when they get to the end game and it's the phalanx and the dominion and all these sci-fi concepts that Hickman laid out in, um, uh, pardon me, in um, Powers of Ten, how do I know it's going to that? Like, how do I know the story's moving there? Um, I don't know anything, <laughs> right? It's all theory, it's all speculation. I'm not involved in the creative process. I think... The possibility that Hickman would bow out of X-Men stuff and the Powers of Ten threads... Powers of Ten is entirely about cosmic and future developments, okay? So if those threads got dropped, that would be exactly the kind of disappointing fallout that everyone was most afraid of when this news happened. So how do I know it's moving to Phalanx and Dominion down the line? Because that's what was set up. Right? Like, why would you plant those seeds? I mean, Hickman's, a, as a plotter, as a strategist, he puts ideas out, and then he moves away from them. You know, think about, like, obviously a very popular example of this is Game of Thrones, right? Game of Thrones, the first episode, has White Walkers. And then we don't see him again for, what, seasons? You know? It's that. Okay? We're planting seeds, and then we're going to come back to them. So, if we plant the seeds, we being the ex-office, of the Dominion and the Phalanx and all these galactic concepts, and we don't come back to them, that would be a failure of a story. I don't care what the organic progression of the story was, how much fun everyone was having playing in the Krakoan ball pit. If those things don't get touched on again, then Powers of Ten would have been a really cool setup that was completely bailed on and did not deliver. You know, it would be a failure, in my opinion. Um, so that's my, my knowledge that we're coming back to that, is generally just like hope. I mean, it is hope and it is optimism that that is the thing that makes the most sense and would lead to the best stories. So I don't know it. I don't know it, uh, but I hope it and I suspect it will happen because otherwise I just, I I think this whole thing would be a, a tremendous, tremendous letdown and I think the creators are too smart for that. So, all right, let's let's run through some questions that you all have. Um, any new way of X theories now that you've talked to Cy? So as I mentioned and, and will continue to mention now that I am a hotshot journalist um, pulling scoops from my interviews with, with famous popular comics writers. I've been doing that for a year. <laughs> uh, Cy Spurrier I talked to you on, uh, on the, the YouTube live this week. Again, check out the video if you're so inclined. Um, Cy makes uh, interviews incredibly easy because he's remarkably eloquent and, and thoughtful. 
Um, but I will say, you know, having done about 60 creator interviews basically since the, the pandemic kicked off in 2020, um, it was definitely one of my best. I felt really good about it. I felt really good about it. It's much easier for me to uh, ask questions about X-Men comics, as you might suspect, because I have a, a fair amount of investment and uh, I talk about them too much. So, but any new way of X theories now that you talk to Cy? Um, not tremendously, no. I mean, I think there's some stuff there that he talked about that I had definitely read before in interviews, you know, in Adventures in Poor Taste, um, the X-Men Monday columns. Uh, there wasn't, like, obviously, like, he didn't want to spoil anything, and I didn't want him to spoil anything. So it wasn't, like, any dead giveaways. Um, I think probably the thing that was most interesting to me in rereading it and in listening to him talk about everything was one question that I asked I was, so in Way of X number five, this will be a spoiler for Way of X for those of you who might want to bail on that. In Way of X number five, um, it's revealed that in Resurrection, Krakoan Resurrection, when mutants come back, they come back with like the shadow of Onslaught over them. Okay, so Onslaught is like this virus, this like evil virus essentially, that is bas that has basically affected all of Krakoa because it's like anyone who's been resurrected, which is like most of mutant kind at this point, right? Um, so Spurrier said, after I asked him, he said that that wasn't necessarily intended to color like the entire Krakoan era, you know? And there's wiggle room here, and it's going to get addressed in Onslaught Revelation, I'm sure, in some ways or other. But my main concern with that revelation was then it's like, okay, so everyone's saying the X-Men co are coming back as pod people, and they're being manipulated, whether by Professor X or somebody, they're being manipulated to act like someone else, you know, like other characters, not like themselves. They're right, <laughs> because Onslaught is this evil entity pushing them to do things they would not have otherwise done. I actually think that kind of taints and spoils a lot of what is good about the co era and a lot of what makes sense, you know, in terms of the, the, that broad recurring question that keeps happening, which is... Um, are the X-Men the villains now? And I think what Spurrier said there was essentially like, he didn't say it quite this way, and again, you should listen to the interview for context and the full answers, but it's basically like, that's kind of not my expectation, you know, or that's kind of not my intent to say that about the whole era. Um, it's really about being a little more localized and about just kind of the, the metaphysics and sort of the questions about resurrection that I think a lot of us have. But it's not necessarily intended to taint the Krakow era. So I'm really excited about, you know, getting some specifics on that in Onslaught Revelation. Um, I still don't, I still don't know what Act 2 is going to be for sure, right? And I'm not totally clear, frankly, on what Nightcrawler's big idea is, right? Because the whole build of Way of X is him getting, finding his way to this revelation, which seems to be sort of rooted in, like, at the end of this, it's like Krakoa, it, wherever a mutant is, that is Krakoa. Kind of this idea of like, Krakoa is all mutants and all mutants are Krakoa. They are one people, they are one land, this kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure, like that's a, that's the spark of the idea, but I'm not sure exactly how that's going to manifest. And just when you listen to, to other interviews I've read with Spurrier, um, the way he talks about the idea he settled on for Nightcrawler um it sounds like, like 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 Einstein being like, oh, I just got relativity. Like, I, it clicked. So, like, it's this massive thing. So I'm super excited to see that uh, play out in action. But no, I don't. I definitely don't have, like, an amazing, amazing theory there for that one. Um, okay, so we got another question here. Been dying to know where 2099 fits into this era of X-Men. Marvel said no matter what events happen, that they always lead to 2099. You are the best, BT Dubs. Thank you. I appreciate that. That is very nice of you to say. Um, I... If Marvel has said that, like, that's great for 2099, I don't really view the 2099 universe as this locked-in state of affairs for X-Men especially. Like, probably the only franchise that I would treat 2099 as a future that almost certainly comes to pass is Spider-Man, because Spider-Man 2099 is the coolest of all of 2099, <laughs> you know, with the exception of, like, Doom, probably, who was just doom again um but with x-men i don't expect that um i think you know this actually ties to cable reloaded the issue that came out today and i talk about this in the crack in krakoa where the idea is like the future is a changing thing cable's quote in that in that issue that is effectively like the future's always changing and we're just i'm just going to keep fighting for a better tomorrow 
kind of thing, okay? So I think when you're talking about the X-Men, you're talking about futures that will come to pass. Um, there's no lock. There's no locked and loaded future. It's a shifting, evolving timeline that we're dealing with in X-Men uh, because if it was locked, then all of Moira's scheming wouldn't matter. And we'd kind of be able to know that because we have time travel <laughs> in the Marvel Universe. So they kind of have to keep it that way. Um, could, could you do a story where X Men 2099 are in or are involved with, uh, you know, some of the powers of 10 crew, like in those futures with a Nimrod or a Man Machine Uprising? Sure, uh, sure, you could. But I think, you know, a big reason not to <laughs> would be X Men 2099, it does not have. Uh, a lot of staying power. It has not had a very memorable history. Um, I have a full run <laughs> right over here, but it is like that's that those are not books people go back to. Could someone do a continuity poll and make that really cool? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but I, I'd be surprised. All right, another question here. Yo, Dave, how do you feel about Ewing's writing in regards to the levels Hickman works at, often being smart political stories and classic cape comics? Um, yeah, I mean, again, like they're tough. They're tough writers to compare. Like I said, like on my best Marvel Comics list for the past three years, it has constantly been, or I guess maybe two years, 19 to 20, because how, that's when House of Powers came in, it's constantly been a Hickman versus Ewing battle in terms of do I like Immortal Hulk more or do I like House of Powers more or do I like Hickman's X-Men more, right? That sort of thing. Now it's, you know, that's, that's going to be somewhat negligible this year, but the same thing, you know, I'll be debating the same sorts of things. Um, in, in 2021, where I'll be looking at, okay, Hickman's X-Men issues, his Inferno versus um, versus Ewing's Immortal Hulk wrapping up, plus Sword, plus Guardians. You know, Ewing's definitely got him on quantity for sure. Um, I, I think they're, they're in a similar stratosphere. Hickman's bigger, right? Hickman's a bigger name. He's a bigger draw. Um, you know, he's... He's an established creator to a degree that Ewing is not because I think primarily, you know, Hickman has creator own works that that have sort of become mainstays, right? He was there for the image boom from, you know, whatever, 2011 through 2015 or whatever it is exactly um, in a way that Ewing was not, right? That's kind of when he's really coming up. Oh, I didn't mention Loki Agent Asgard. It's another amazing Al Ewing comic. But like, I think, yeah, I think they're close. I mean, I think they're, they're different stylistically, certainly. Um, Ewing is... I would say leans into uh, characters' heart, sort of characters' emotions, probably more effectively than Hickman often does. I think Hickman gets probably overstated in terms of how cold and calculating he is. I actually think he can be a very funny, very charming writer. Oftentimes, you know, you see that in Fantastic Four, especially with the kids, right, in the Future Foundation. Um, you see that come through, the capabilities there. But a lot of times his characters, you know, if you look at like a run like New Avengers, you know, everyone in New Avengers in, in the Hickman world, they all talk like philosopher kings. They all talk in quotables, you know, like they're writing their own Bible. Um, Al Ewing does not write like that. I think he does huge, Kirby, ham-fisted, and I say that in the best way possible, cosmic stuff better than just about anybody. That literal bludgeon you over the head, hits you with giant-sized letters, cosmic stuff, kind of better than anybody. Um, I don't think he has, for me, he does not have the reputation or the um, um, the track record of laying out as much strategic groundwork as Hickman has, you know, of saying, here's 12 amazing ideas, and we're going to get to these over the course of X issues. Uh, I don't think Ewing has had that, although he also kind of hasn't had, with the exception of Mortal Hulk, like the playground to do that. You know, Ultimates and Ultimates 2 don't go for nearly long enough. Um, you know, they, they kind of, and they're also like this weird fringe piece of the Marvel Universe. So I think, honestly, like this year and the next couple of years are going to be really interesting for Al Ewing at Marvel because right now he should have and seemingly does have the keys to Marvel Cosmic and the keys to, um, and the keys to like the X-Men's, you know, like, sword, right? To like some of the most interesting X-Men comics. If we come out of the next couple years and it's like Al Ewing was kind of treading water, that'll be really disappointing. You know, like this is this is absolutely an opportunity where he can ascend to the level that I think Hickman got to in terms of reputation and in terms of fandom during late stage Avengers and New Avengers. Um, I think that's a potential future, but you know, it's going to take some time and, and some amazing comics to get there. 
Uh, all right, we got another a lot of questions. Keep them coming. Uh, thanks everybody, especially thanks everybody who's gotten in questions via the super chat. Uh, super appreciated. Really appreciate the donations here and contributions to Comfort Apparel to keep this thing going and, and going strong and making it fun to hop on a casual crew call every week. I'm actually just going to answer this one really quick. Sir Grolon asks here in the comments, don't you find it weird that Trial of Magneto and Inferno are going to come out and end basically at the same time? Yeah, <laughs> I really do. Uh, I was just looking at that in the, um, you know, just trying to get a feel for the timeline. I had in my head that Trial of Magneto was going to be weekly. And I guess I'm glad it's not because that tends to go poorly and the timing and the pacing of that can be really, really difficult. Um, but yeah, it's going to be really tricky. Like to have two event-sized things with the ramifications that those types of stories are going to have happening at the same time. And I'm sure that's something that has been accounted for and planned for. But if we run into a scenario where, you know, it kind of, and I'll be thinking about this because I'll be making them read Norton Armand of X, but if it kind of just feels like, um, hey, yeah, you should just read all of Trial of Needle before all of Inferno, but that's not how they're going to be released, obviously, um, I'm going to be pretty bummed out about that. So I did think that was weird. I hope it's accounted for and that it's fairly intentional in that those stories intersect in ways that, that play together nicely. All right, another question. Do you think Storm is more powerful than Magneto after her comment last week? Um, I, uh, they're both a mega level. So they are both the most powerful that they can be. <laughs> you know, I'm not big on this character versus that character stuff. I don't, that stuff doesn't matter a heck of a lot to me, I have to admit. Um, but I think, you know, Storm is an Omega level mutant. Magneto is an Omega level mutant. They're a handful who are defined that way. I think they both have pretty absurdly powerful capabilities, right? Uh, I would rather have Storm on my side and team than Magneto. I'll say that. I'll definitely say that. Do you think the writers have no love or ideas for characters like Vulcan and Bay the Blood Moon? Um... I'm not going to speak for, like, right or emotion around a character, but in terms of ideas, Bay of the Blood Moon, I'm certain they have ideas. I'm certain. Uh, that was not, I mean, maybe it was, but, like, that didn't feel like a Hickman creation. Uh, Bay of the Blood Moon married Doug in a, a Teeny Howard written comic, you know? So I imagine there's a plan there uh, with that Araku character. I think all the Araku characters, it's like they are a blank fresh slate for all these creators to go nuts with. Um, so, yes, we should see more Bay the Blood Moon, and it should be cool. Uh, regarding Vulcan, obviously that is a Hickman plot. Again, my theory is Vulcan is going to be weaponized by those weird aliens in the upcoming Inferno. Um, so I think Hickman will hit that one hard. Uh, if he doesn't, if he doesn't, then I bet, based on what Cy Spurrier said, you know, based on the way the X-Office functions and, and the way everything goes, like, I bet they have the plans I bet they know what the intent was for Vulcan, and somebody will get to it when they have a cool idea. Uh, regarding love for those characters, you'd have to ask all the individual creators. I, I have no idea. Last question. Why do you think that, or this is, so this is someone else saying the last question, not me. <laughs> you don't get to tell me when the last question is. Uh, my wife does. <laughs> last question. Why do you think that the Quiet Council members are not acting more political with each other? Uh, I think they are acting pretty political with each other, actually. Um... I think I would probably probably dispute the premise there. I, I think, you know, Emma, Kate, Sebastian, they've been scheming politically, you know, for power the whole time, right? The Hellfire Club, that's very much in their, their nature. Um, Professor X is playing everyone. Magneto's now, they're in, you know, basically they're having a political dispute, essentially, over Kirk Cohen Law and Resurrection Protocols. So um, I, I think they are acting politically. I think they're, they're, every time we go to like a quiet council scene, for a long time at least, like, it was pretty exciting, you know? Like, it was a really exciting thing to get to the politics and the governance of Krakoa. Um, I think maybe some of that magic has been lost a little bit, and I think probably, like, Trial Magneto and Inferno need to restore that a little bit. So I do think there could be... I, and part of maybe what you're describing here is, like, the Quiet Council is kind of busted right now, you know? Like, we're missing members, and members have left, and... Storm wasn't supposed to be a part of it, but still apparently is because she was sitting there in trial of Magneto talking about Magneto's resurrection protocols. So um, I think we need the Quiet Council kind of like restored and f and um, refilled. Sort of like we have a Kirkcone X-Men uh, election, 
you know, I feel like the quiet council is kind of due for like, I mean, obviously they weren't elected, but, but something in that vein. Um, all right, next question. In the modern age of corporate risk aversion, in the future, do you think the MCU will have more influence on creative decisions post Inferno? Uh, no, I don't. I, I don't think the Inferno of it all will make a difference. Um, if the MCU is going to, and Kevin Feige is going to step in and say, uh, you know, hey, all the comics need to move towards certain directions for the way we're going in the movies, um, they will do that regardless of anything that happens in Inferno or any Hickman involvement in X-Men. I mean, I don't, I don't think they're that, <laughs> they're not as caught up in it as I am. I bet you that. Um, I don't think right now, really, that the MCU has a heck of a lot of say in what happens in the comics. You know, they're still pretty uh, much running on their own tracks. I think Marvel writers, you know, there's a degree certainly of lagging synergy in terms of characters acting more like their MCU counterparts, but that happens with movies historically over time anyway, right? Like that's kind of natural. Um, in some cases it's fine, you know, like with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, I get it. You want them, you want that team to represent what it looks like in the MCU. Um, I mean, the Robert Downey jr of Iron Man was a huge positive in the MCU. I don't necessarily like it at all in the comics, but I'm also not fighting it. It happened, <laughs> and that is the world we live in now. Um, but I mean, as far as like, I mean, people keep talking about, you know, oh, the, uh, you know, all the stuff with Hickman and Inferno, and it's all, it's all MCU related, and the MCU just wants the X-Men on Krakoa, because that's what they're going to do for the movie, and like, that that type of talk to me is like, that's someone fully, fully invested in comics, and hey, me too, I get it, um, who's just not thinking big picture, like, I, the MCU doesn't care what comics coming out, are coming out when a movie comes out, like, Marvel barely gets only recently too, like barely gets comics tied into a movie or a TV show out at the same time. You know, when WandaVision came out, do you know what everyone was Googling? They were Googling WandaVision comics. And do you know what they were getting? They were getting my guy on comicbookherald.com for the best comics to read with WandaVision because there's no comic called WandaVision, right? Marvel doesn't hit synergy in these really obvious MCU ways. Um, they just don't do it. They still don't. I mean, was there even a Loki ongoing? When Loki came out, there was not, right? So uh, these this level of, like, connection and synergy, I just don't think it exists. I think in Marvel Comics, they get to tell stories that can serve as inspiration. And often, you know, the MCU can come in and pillage that. And sometimes it's it's great because it leads to great product. And other times I'm kind of like, oh, they kind of just stole Winter Soldier. <laughs> they kind of just stole that plot and apparently didn't pay after Breaker. So, but anyway, I don't think the MCU will have an influence on what's to come in X-Men. Um, I think X-Men will get to continue to sell their story. Uh, could the MCU take something from House and Powers and Krakoa because it's so successful and so cool? Yeah, absolutely. That's what they do, right? They take they take from the good in Marvel Comics and then they mash it all up with other stuff and they get something that is specifically MCU. Speaking of Marvel Cosmic, do you think Al Ewing is the new Abnett and Lanning in terms of being the premier architect of the Cosmic side of Marvel? Yeah. I mean, I think that's what I'm saying here, right? Like, that's that's what I'm, I'm kicking off with, is Al Ewing is the head of Marvel Cosmic. Um, he is controlling the Marvel Cosmic destiny, the fabric of it. Uh, I, I think, on one hand, I like leaving that to Al Ewing. On the other hand, because that is very big and vast, I do wonder if Al could use some help. <laughs> and I don't want it to be creators who do their own thing and it conflicts, right? So like Donny Cates, right, had his sort of his own thing, but at the same time that Ewing was doing a lot of his own thing, that doesn't work great. Um, but evaluating, you know, is there a, uh, could he be a head of Cosmic and then like some talented up and coming creators doing side projects within that network? I think that'd be cool. But yeah, I mean, I think the Dan Abnett and Andy Lanning Guardians in, in Annihilation Era and, and all those great, great Cosmic comics, um, I think that's what you hope to get. That's what you hope to recapture with Al Ewing leading the line and leading all these direction, directions for, for these comics is something that is as good or close as that. And right now it's not that, but it has that potential. So I, I absolutely think that's the goal and I think Ewing's the right person for it. Do you think Cable isn't telling anyone about the future um, X-Men Extinction because he thinks he can change it with the extermination team? Uh, I think... There's probably a couple reasons. So again, I talk about this in Cable, the Cable Reloaded review. But um, on one hand, I think Cable, he thinks the future is changing. 
He thinks the future is always shifting. So if he tells the X-Men, hey, this is exactly how the X-Men go extinct, and this is the first Krakoan age that I've lived through, there's going to be another one, and he tells them these things, there's the chance that, like, then th then that stuff doesn't happen and they've prepared for the wrong thing. Um, I think the other thing, the way Nathan Summers seems to be thinking, the way he's been written here, at least by Duggan and Ewing, he's frequently thinking, I don't want to tell you, oh, it's all going to be okay, because then you won't fight as hard. Then you won't try as hard, and then we'll fail the mission. Like, like there's a recurring theory, there's a recurring um, emphasis here that, you know, you still have to do the work, and you have to do it to the best of your ability, otherwise that future doesn't come to pass. So I think that's a big part of why Cable's a little uh, cagey with details of the future. Um, I, I, I think it's also a bit of a narrative cop-out. You know, it is a bit of a narrative cop-out. Like, I do think it would be really fun to have the mutant character from the future who just can't stop talking about what happens, right? Maybe someone like a Trevor Fitzroy, right? Somebody who's just a total different moral moral status, right? And they come in and they just won't stop telling people what happens and what they know. Um, that would be a fun character to have to deal with and to have to write around and to have to come up with interesting, challenging ways to deal with time travel and knowledge of what comes in the future. Uh, but I think that's specifically why Cable doesn't do it as a character. Um, like Bishop right now, I have no idea. I have no idea where Bishop's head at, head's at, and that's kind of a bummer. I, I want to know more. Uh, I kind of want Bishop off in Marauders, honestly. Like, I, I want Bishop in a different book with a different creator who has some thoughts on what to do with that character. Uh, we got a question here from Brayden who asks, do you expect a Fantastic Four sword crossover in the future? Because I've noticed that Ewing bounces off slots concepts uh, in FF, including Empire, Doom, and the Forever Gate in Immortal Hulk and others. Uh, Ewing and Slot seem to have a fine collaborative relationship. They wrote Empire together, which was a fine Marvel event. Um, you know, I would not have expected that. In Fantastic Four, you also have, obviously, the notorious, controversial Franklin Richards development, where he was demutantized. I'm a Here's the thing. I didn't like that development. And I don't like Dan Slott's Fantastic Four. As a result, I, I'm feeling a little bit like I don't want him to get to go and play in the X-Men playground. That kind of crossover makes sense, right? In, in, in a vacuum, Fantastic Four and Sword crossing over, or, or even just bigger, right? If we're talking about Ewing as the cosmic architect of Marvel right now, absolutely, you can bring Fantastic Four into that playground. You have to, right? They're, they're cosmonauts, they're adventurers. Um, of the galactic, like that makes a ton of sense. So it could happen. Uh, I could see it. It actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, he, that's the thing with Ewing is like, he reads other people's work and he incorporates those ideas. Like that's why his tie-ins are so good. You know, like that's why he's he's the literal best event tie-in writer is because he's like actually reads the other people's comics and gets a feel for what they're doing and what works and what, it, what doesn't. And he has a, a really keen sense of that. Um, so I hope it doesn't happen, but I think you're probably on the right track. That's interesting. Uh, that that could, there's a big Franklin Richards story still to tell. Could we actually do it with the X-Men office's involvement? Maybe it'd be better if we did. Um, okay. We got another note here. Uh, this one from new type JB. Thank you so much for the super chat support. And thanks to everybody who's gotten any questions and super chat today. It is tremendously appreciated. To me, I don't mind Ewing being the core visionary. To me, the cosmic side works best when it's more separate from the rest of the Marvel Universe. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with the first part. With the second part, that's a tricky one because Annihilation from, you know, the, the 2006, really it's like 2004 if you go back to Drax the Destroyer mini, but like with, with Keith Gibbon, who doesn't get enough credit for all this, but um, from, from Annihilation in like 2006 through kind of the end of the Abnett and Lanning era in, what was that, Thanos Imperative was 2010, then you get the Annihilators, really it's done by that point. Let's say 2010. It is largely free from the Marvel Universe of Earth, right? You get certain characters, you know, you have Nova, obviously is the Earth-based hero, um, but you get Annihilation, you get Annihilation Conquest, you get War of Kings, you get uh, Realm of Kings, right? And then you get Thanos Imperative, all of that does a pretty good job of staying away from Earth. I mean, even War of Kings, which brings in more Earth elements in humans and X-Men, it's all the space-based stuff. 
it's all the X-Men Shi'ar connections with Vulcan, of course. And then with the Inhumans, that's at a point in their history where they're just like traveling the spaceways, being all Cree friendly, <laughs> right? So the best example of Marvel Cosmic working in modern memory uh, is definitely removed from the Earth. I think that's why most people have that or share that opinion is because the most modern memory of that, that is how it happened. But if you run it back to like the 70s with, again, Jim Starlin, the OG, um, his cosmic stuff is not necessarily removed from Earth. You know, if you think about Captain Marvel and the way that that first Thanos story ends, it's on Earth in a big Avengers battle. Um, if you think about the way he wraps his Warlock and Thanos saga, it's with the Earth-based Avengers and Spider-Man even, and those heroes traveling from Earth to Thanos' spaceship to take him out. So I don't necessarily think that it can't be done well. I think it just hasn't been done well in a long time. Um, and and that's that doesn't necessarily mean the sides shouldn't intersect more. It's a I think it is definitely easier if you're Al Ewing and you're writing Sword and you're writing um, Guardians of the Galaxy to stay off Earth as much as possible and to really hit home the fact that this is cosmic and this is a different thing and that we're not going to swing through New York. Let's get some different landscapes for goodness sake. Um, and I think too, like, you know, with, with sword now, especially it's like, you have a planet, <laughs> you have Mars now for mutant kind, uh, not leveraging that would be a, 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 you know, just malpractice. So yeah, it's, it's a good point, but I, I think that's why. All right. So I think I covered all the key questions here that I got. Um, definitely. If you have any final thoughts, let's get them in now. I think otherwise, you know, I've probably been going close to an hour, but seriously, thanks so much, everybody, for making the most casual of all casual Krakoas <laughs> a fun time and having plenty to talk about. Uh, we did have a question up top here. It says, hi, Dave. So how does getting the older cable back play out in the long game? Okay, so I, I alluded to this a little bit in the Cable Reloaded review on Crack and Krakoa, but um, one, I'm excited to have Old Man Cable back. Like, definitely reading Cable Reloaded, I was like, I've been, you know, pretty neutral on Teen Cable. I don't hate it. You know, I thought that run was fine. Uh, but uh, but having Old Man Cable back, I was like, oh, this is a lot more interesting. <laughs> it's a lot more interesting. This is just a character who has so much history and so much connection to the Marvel Universe, to the X-Men families, um, and also just, like, he's a, he's a strategist himself. Like, having Cable, you know, he talked about making the Quiet Council interesting again or filling in some of those vacant seats. Cable's a player who would be super fascinating in a role like that, right? Like that is the level of tactical intelligence, of of involvement, of care for protecting a mutant future, you know, right? Who rivals Cable in that? That's his whole deal. Uh, so just having a character like that that you can play with is a really, really cool idea. Um, and, and it makes, I think, the X-Men a lot more exciting in ways that I kind of wasn't fully anticipating. I think in the long game, I mean, I think Cable's going to... I expect, because he's already in position as the chief of security or whatever with S.W.O.R.D., that Cable's role is going to be very cosmic. I kind of suspect, and that's how it's starting, so it could shift, right? But I kind of suspect Cable's not going to spend a lot of time on Krakoa proper and is instead going to be up in space with Abigail Brand doing all the cosmic stuff and being... I think hopefully in Al Ewing written character for a good long time. Um, and I think like then as we build to the end game, that's what Cable's missions are going to be tied to most closely is sort of figuring all of that galactic intelligence stuff out. I think that's a great fit for Cable. It's kind of a unique angle for the character because often Cable is just on Earth fighting, you know, the X-Force battles with human or mutant enemies. Um, I think it gives Cable something new to do, but something that is still warlike and and needs battle and all that stuff so that's kind of what i hope for for old man cable i think that'd be a really cool fit um all right we got i think uh a few more super chants here thanks everybody for getting them in i will get to as many as i can here once i figure out where i put them <laughs> in my notepad that i try to keep track of these on there's got to be more uh fancier ways Fancier ways to do these things. Uh, last question here from Newton JB says, New Type JB, should Carol and Monica, aka the two Captain Marvels, be more involved with Marvel Cosmic? 
Um, no, because... Actually, two-part. Carol, no. Monica, yes. <laughs> Carol Danvers was very involved with Marvel Cosmic. Um, she was running Alpha Flight, which got rebranded as the Canadian super team. They became the sword, essentially, the, the space defense of that uh, universe. And um, Carol's had her shot, and she blew it. She was not great at the as the defender of space. She gave it back to Abigail Brand intentionally. So I don't think Carol should have more involvement with Marvel Cosmic. Monica Rambeau, on the other hand, that's a character that Al Ewing used very, very well in um, in Ultimates, right? In, in in other works as well. I think maybe she's in his um, in his New Avengers. Uh, I don't know what Monica's doing otherwise. I'm not reading literally everything uh, in real time, but I think we could we could always use more Monica Rambeau in the Marvel Cosmic scene. That would be she'd be a good Guardian of the Galaxy, actually. I think getting uh, Photon on there. Uh, we got a comment here from Ryan. Enjoy your channel. I think you don't criticize enough, but have a lot of compassion and dedicate a lot of time and effort for your videos. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, you know, I, I don't... I mean, I, I try to be critical. I try to think critically <laughs> in general. Um, I think there's a lot of negativity, and it's, it's easy to sort of fly into a rage uh, in fandom. And I think YouTube gets a rap for that especially. Right when you get off of YouTube, and you look at the ways that comics critics and and creators talk about fandom and commentary on YouTube, it's very negative. Um, so I try to bring something else to the table, and I try to bring a the enthusiasm of someone who really likes comics, who wants them to be good, and and also just like you said, like the compassion and just like the self awareness that we're talking about real people here, uh, you know, in terms of creators. Not in terms of the characters. The real to me, but not them. The creators, like, these are real people. And they generally want to do well. <laughs> and they're not rolling around in their mansions and money, not caring about whatever happens, right? So I think, you know, it, it when I don't like things, I will talk about not liking them. I mean, if you watch Crack and Krakoa, as you will see, definitely, um, there are comics I don't like as much. Uh, I don't want to harp on that because I think... That gets boring, and it gets um, just it just repeats the same criticisms over and over. Often, like you know, and I I, I ran into this with Excalibur early on, right? Where it was like, okay, if I'm going to cover every issue of Excalibur, I have a problem here because every other issue of Excalibur I'm really out on, and I don't like the series. Um, you know, it's like so, and I, I had this actually probably the earliest time it happened on ComicCarol.com was when I was reviewing Agents of Shield. It was the, the show on ABC. I really didn't like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. after a long time. I actually grew to really dislike it. I thought it was was a bust and it was really disappointing. Um, but, you know, it's like I don't need to write a negative episode review every week to reiterate that point. I've made that point. People know. And it just gets kind of boring. So And then, I, and then you get to a point, too, where it's like you have the crowd of people who are like, yeah, I know, but I like it. And then you have the crowd of people who are like, I agree. And you're not saying anything new. So it's a difficult thing. I mean, that doesn't mean, again, like, I'm all for being critical. It, critical in the sense of evaluating what works, evaluating what doesn't, um, being being thoughtful in the way you dissect those things so that uh, we have good conversations and thoughtful conversations about how comics work and what we care about in these comics and all that stuff. Um, but I, I think being critical for the sake of, you know, rage bait, like, that is not something I'm definitely a part of or, or want to be a part of. And I think that's a reputation that YouTube has. And I absolutely want to be removed from that. So, um, you know, I, I, I think like, I, I, I don't think I don't call out problems when I see them, you know, I don't run from that. Um, and if you listen to these casual Kirk calls too, you know, the last handful of weeks, obviously, like I talk about, like when I don't like books, but you know, so I, I don't know, it's something I take seriously, obviously, because there's some, even with my small, you know, small empire here on Comic Book Herald, um, you also, you know, there's also some level of responsibility in terms of not targeting creators and not driving, uh, you know, anger that is already manifesting in other ways towards towards real individuals. But I think as far as the works go, I'm more than happy to criticize. And uh, and I think I do. But I mean, you know, I think a big part of it, too, is like when people are like, oh, you, you know, you're too optimistic or, you're, you know, you're a shill for X-Men or whatever. Um, I like this stuff. 
<laughs> I do. Like, I pretty authentically like comics, and I like, um, I like X-Men. So it's not hard for me to be positive about it because it is a thing I'm inclined to enjoy. And I go through moods where I don't. I mean, if you've been listening to Casual Krakoa's over the last few weeks, you've absolutely heard uh, me talk about I'm way more down on the Jerry Duggan era of X-Men than I think a lot of people are, you know? And, and I've been very, very uh, true about that and very, very authentic about that. So I think what you'll find for me is you'll find authentic reviews, authentic criticism. If I hate an X-Men comic um, and it's like on issue four and I've already reviewed it, I'm not going to make a point of holding it up and being like, this sucks, here's why. <laughs> you know? Um, but, like, if Inferno number one came out and it was horrible, I could say that. I'm not afraid of saying that. It's more the unlikeliness of that happening is incredibly high. <laughs> you know? So, anyway, I, I try to bring more of that positivity to the YouTube channel. I think YouTube needs a lot more of that. Um, it's why I like channels on here like Blurred Without Fear, obviously. Like, I have Ernie on and we talk. I like uh, what Matt Draper does with really thoughtful comics criticism that I, you know, I pay him to run the written articles that he writes for his videos. You know, I pay to run those as articles on comicbookherald.com. Um, for Every Kind of Geek is a channel I love. I think Doug does the same thing. I'm, I'm running his articles as well. Uh, such a good video editor. So much better than everything else in comics YouTube. It is absurd how good he is at making videos. If you haven't checked out For Every Kind of Geek, check out his House of X and Powers of 10 video. It is absolutely uh, essential. So I don't know, there are probably others that I, that I really dig that I'm not thinking of right now. But uh, but yeah, that's my, my general thinking there. But but seriously, thank you for the, the compliment and for the for the note there. All right, last thing. How about DeFalco or DeMatteis back for the cosmic side? Their Silver Surfer stuff was so good and it seems like they have a good grasp on cosmic stuff. Okay, I talked about this last week. Um, listen, cool, uh, fun run, right? Nothing against Tom DeFalco and J.M. DeMatteis. I do not want creators who peaked decades ago involved with X-Men. <laughs> I'm not interested in that. I don't get why fans are today, um, aside from nostalgia. And this isn't specifically targeted to this question, okay? Because it, the question's totally innocent. It's a good question. DeFalco and DeMatteis. I think DeMatteis in particular. Like, I really like, like, Curtis Lost Hunt. Is, come on. It's classic. It's amazing. Um, I think uh, DeMatteis read a really underrated Captain America run, which we which we talked about in um, uh, My Marvelous Year, the podcast where we go through the history of, of Marvel Comics, right? So no shade at these creators, specifically. But again, you know, and the most common one you see here are like Chris Claremont or, or Rob Liefeld even. And it's like, if a creator peaked decades ago, or John Byrne, actually, is probably a more common one, peaked decades ago, they don't need to come in and touch X-Men comics. Now, now there's a negative side to this, which is like, I guess like kind of ageism and like booting out older creators. Like it's a hard thing to age comfortably into big two comics. You don't see that a lot. You know, there's a, creators in comics get treated more like athletes than like novelists. You know, it's an interesting thing. And I, I don't know that it's always a good thing, right? But after a certain point, you know, like there are creators who just don't get work, right? There's So there's maybe a negative side to that in terms of like just wanting the freshness or the newness. But generally, the desire to have, let's say, a John Byrne come in and work on X-Men comics is rooted so much more in nostalgia than it is bringing anything fresh or interesting to the table. And you can have that nostalgia. You can have enjoyed that era. That's great. But you can, we all, we'll always have that moment. We'll always have those comics. We can always go back to them. It's super easy with Marvel Unlimited. Uh, but do not need new comics from any, any creators who peaked decades ago, okay? And I think the thing you'll find, too, is, like, one of the reasons it is... One of the good reasons creators don't get to age along with comics is that's a really hard thing to do, it would seem, for, for so many of these creators. Like, so many of these creators, they, they they lose their fastball, again, for the sports metaphor. You know? Like, there are writers who, like Chris Claremont, obviously, is the, you know, the, the key example. The X-Head, the God of X, from 1975 to 1991, 
read a Chris Claremont comic from the year 2000 to now, it does not have the same fastball. It's just not the same thing. And I don't think he stopped loving X-Men. I think, if, if anything, he still does. Um, but it's like, you know, he like I bet Claremont wishes he was the head of X still. It seems to be every interview, every vibe is that. Um, those comics would not be as good. They just would not. And, you know, you, you see that with, with all sorts of creators. I mean, I think the creators that have aged gracefully, you know, would be like a Stan Sakai on Usagi Ujimbo. I think what he's doing on, on Usagi is incredible. You know, that's a creator who, like, can, who still has it. Um, Walt Simonson with Thor Ragnarok. You know, so it's not unheard of. Um, obviously, like, there's others. There's plenty. Grant Morrison, obviously, right? Like, there's plenty. But uh, I think in Big Two Comics, that is a truly, truly rare thing. It does not happen often. And um, and it's not the answer we're looking for. Not really. Uh, I, I don't think. I mean, I'd be curious if people had suggestions for creators who were really good in their time who could step in now and really bring something fresh to the table. Uh, you know, um, but I, I don't think there are going to be a heck of a lot of them. So, all right. Thanks, everybody, so much for all the questions. Uh, really good conversation. Uh, hopefully you agree. <laughs> I guess I'm the only one who talked, but I enjoyed getting the questions here. I enjoyed uh, answering some different stuff today, talking about a heck of a lot more than just the X-Men comics that came out. Again, Cable Reloaded, I got the full Kraken Krakoa up on the channel. I really dug it. It's a fun tie-in. It's a really good use of, of Cable Reloaded, and it really solidified my faith, I think, in Al Ewing as a big fan of um, Marvel Cosmic. And Wolverine number 15, I really like the solemn arc. I do. Um, I'm not like blown away by it. It's still, I think the series is too comfortable, but I think Solomon and Arako stuff is the most interesting that uh, Wolverine has been for some time. So thanks everybody for hopping on. I'm going to go. Uh, I'll be here next week on Casual Kirkcaw and we'll talk about the X-Men comics that come out next week. But in the meantime, thanks for joining. I really appreciate it. Check out the Sysburger interview if you haven't already. Uh, it was really some of my, my best work. And by that, I mean, uh, I let Sy talk. <laughs> and it's pretty good. So thanks everybody for joining and enjoy the comics.